Hey everyone, Brian Castor here with Brian's Bees. Today we're gonna to be taking some bees out of a roof space up here. We're gonna get just walking up. Really, really common where these roof pieces all meet for the bees to find a little gap and get into the attic space. So what we're gonna be doing today is opening up the roof, getting into the attic, and getting these bees out. And I have with me here today, Matt, who is our CME tech. He does LA and Ventura. So we're gonna get rolling on this and uh, we'll see how it goes. So the first step is to really get your face in there, hands in there, whatever. Figure out where the bees are at. Because our big question is which of these sections are the bees in? Are they in that section where he has hand in? Section to the left of it, section to the right of it. You don't want to open up the wrong spot. You don't want to poke holes in the wrong spot, right? So it's really, really important that we figure out where they're marching to and which section they're in so that we can uh, make sure we do the least amount of damage possible. So normally we would just poke a hole, but these folks are getting their roof replaced in the next week. So we can kind of be given free reign to tear stuff up as much as we want. So we're going to be a little bit rougher and a little bit more uh, more extreme on this than we normally would be. Normally we just poke a hole, but in this case we're just going to get the tar out of the way to keep it from mucking up our drills and our other tools. Man, is that another layer of uh, tar paper? Yeah. So one of the things you'll notice in California at least is that it is, with certain types of roofs, like this uh, the shingle type, it is actually completely legal to put a second layer of roofing over the first layer. So in this case, these folks had an old roof and they just put this new roof right on top. Not a big deal, it's just uh, extra tar for us to tear up. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, I believe the rule is two layers max. Every once in a while you'll get someone that didn't do stuff to code, just kept on putting layers and layers of stuff on. But uh, yeah, so in this case we gotta kinda do double the work because we're taking off two layers of roofing instead of just one. Got all the tar out of the way. We got a couple cuts made. Let's see what this looks like. I always try to smoke the bees, it calms them down. It doesn't stop them from trying to get you, but it helps a lot. <laughs> I would just grab that with your hand, man. I think the only thing you're stuck to is bees. Yeah, I think so. The homeowner 
owner says is about two weeks old based on how white everything looks uh, I'm gonna agree so when you get out honeycomb uh, the eh, it's gonna be closer to four weeks now I'm looking at it but when you're getting out honeycomb the problem is when you have brand new comb it just kind of falls apart when you try and preserve it so there's not going to be a whole lot of this honeycomb that we can save some beekeepers might disagree there's a bunch of different ways to do it but our main concern here is going to be to save the bees not so much the comb now if this was a six month old hive it'd be totally different as the comb gets older it gets more rigid and more solid look at that honey and so what we do with all this comb for the most part um, honey always no matter how old or new it is you can't save it because it's just it's so fragile the honey weighs so much um, it just kind of makes a big sticky mess so you really have to take all the honey and we put it in a bucket and put it out in the bee yard and all the bees in the yard will, uh, will rob it out they'll take the honey and put it in their hive so that way it doesn't go to waste and it also doesn't make a too horrible of a mess within the bee want to try to give them a little bit of brood we have plastic frame today the right thing to do would be to rubber band it in if you can save it but um, again if we rubber band it in it's just gonna more or less disintegrate and not help the bees at all so we just want to put enough in there to be a lure and every beekeeper is gonna have a different perspective on on that part I've met some beekeepers that just frankly never keep the comb because they're too worried about disease you don't actually know if this hive has been sprayed before you know um, or if it's got foul brood or got something else. And if you take the, the babies, you take all the disease from the babies too. So everyone's a little different. For us, we're gonna keep just a piece and let the bees rebuild. As we're working we're keeping an eye out for the queen we're not necessarily going to find her we do not have to find her we don't have to see her but if we find her it's a great bonus because that means that you know if we get the queen all the babies we're done if we miss the queen which doesn't happen often but every so often we're not perfect and if you miss the queen and you get all the babies out they'll actually start to rebuild so uh, we really want to do our best to at least have a good feeling that she's in the box. A lot of, a lot of people ask us too, uh, what makes the bees go into the box? They all want to be together, and a lot of the bees that are younger, they don't really fly. It's mostly the old bees that fly. So we want to get as many bees into the box as we can, and that'll make them all hang out together and all stay together. The other thing that helps them stay together is if the queen is in there, they want to be with her and they'll sit there and they'll protect her. Uh, the brood that he put in there helps a lot. And the last thing that we use that really helps is the lemongrass oil. We use a little bit of lemongrass in all our boxes. That way it helps lure them in, makes the whole process easier. And between all of those things, the bees usually stay in the box. <laughs> they don't always listen to our rules. And read the books we read, but you know, we, tr we try. We try to teach them. Get them to speed.
one of the things you might actually notice too is that uh, bees don't like dark colors. They, if you think about a bear or any other thing that goes after them, the dark parts are usually the parts they can get away with stinging. So, uh, as much as they're, I mean, you got maybe one or two grumpy bees bothering Matt, but we actually have about a half dozen covering the camera because we got this black GoPro. So the first job is always to get as much honeycomb out as we reasonably can. There's going to be some uh, some honeycomb that you just can't get. Just it's impossible. It's, I mean, it's not impossible, but it's it's negligible amounts, right? We want to get the big stuff out first, and then once we get the big stuff out, we want to try and take out as many of the bees as we can. And then once we have most of the bees, most of the honeycomb, we can start dealing with the, the nitpicky small stuff. all that honey and so when you're getting rid of bees uh, what I always tell people on the phone too is you know you've got two problems first of all you have the bees second of all you have the honey so as you can see Matt's just about filled up a bucket I mean there's there's some airspace in there and stuff like that but um that's you ever take four gallons of honey right I mean it's it's not a negligible amount of honey we got a nice warm sunny California day so if the bees die, like either from extermination or from just disease, bad luck, whatever, um, it's going to get hot in that attic because the bees are keeping that honeycomb cool so it won't melt. Once it gets too hot, all that wax melts, all the honey comes out, and it'll start filling up this, this insulation that you see down here. For a lot of people, the insulation will just get full of honey and their only problems will be critters, you know, uh, getting beetles and larva and rats and that kind of stuff worst case scenario if there's enough honey to soak through the insulation it'll actually come out the ceiling come out the can lights come out all that kind of stuff and at that point um it's, it's really hard to ignore and when you go to clean out uh, poison there's just toxic waste disposal in processing so it, it cost us give or take depending on the city around four hundred to six hundred dollars just to throw the honeycomb away not to not even to actually like work with the pesticides so once you've got chemicals in there you really want to try to stick to chemicals and have the chemical guys handle it we'll do it but um it's it's hard because once it starts leaking out you have an extra give or take six hundred a thousand dollar bill just to deal with the poison which is no fun for anybody Oh wow. And Matt's doing amazing here by the way, because one of the biggest tricks to this part is being quick. The last thing you want is to give the bees the opportunity to run into a different section, right? You don't want them to run up here into the higher section of the attic. You don't want them running into any of the sections over here or over here. You want them to come out and not have to do any more opening or any more work than you absolutely have to. So then once you get a mostly reasonable amount of bees out physically by grabbing them, you start doing what Matt's doing right now, which is we use a uh, bee repellent bunch of different brands we really love honey bandit honey bandit seems to be the most uh, friendly odor for people in their house we've used a couple other products that were just um, way 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 too harsh and stunk the owners out of their own houses it's no good so you give it just a little bit in that cavity to make the bees uncomfortable and they come flying right out so now that we got most of the cavity empty um, number one job is to get the bees out of the house, right? I mean, that's ultimately what we're here for. Saving the bees is like a bonus. It's, it's good. But realistically, um, people don't pay us to... I guess they do pay us to save the bees, but they're really paying us to get rid of their bees. So when you flush them all out, you end up with situations like this. Where they all 
That's a bad angle. Let's try this. Let's try this. This will be better. So they all end up outside the cavity in these little spaces. We are kind of chasing around. If I had to guess, this is probably where the paint is or somewhere like this. So we'll just keep flushing them. So back to doing handfuls of bees. Now that's what we like to see. It's a little too quiet earlier. And now we get this bee march. And again, you'll see these bees sticking their butts up in the air. They're doing what we call fanning. So even if the queen's not in the box, she'll smell that fanning and she'll come and go into the box too, just like all the rest of them. And again, using the repellent because we want to deny the bees space. Anywhere that we don't want the bees at, we want to get repellent at. And you get kind of a tug of war game where they're going to be looking at different places to land. It kind of looks like we have something going on over there, for example. And uh, we'll eventually end up with the only place for them to left to land is the box. And that's when we win. Every so often they do something like this where they kind of live on the drift. is basically a job all done. I'm going to give this about 10 or 15 minutes, let as many of these bees go into the box as possible, and then we will be going on to the next.